Today's reading is from John chapter 7, verses 25 to 44. At that point, some of the people of Jerusalem began to ask, Isn't this the man they are trying to kill? Here he is, speaking publicly, and they are not saying a word to him. Have the authorities really concluded that he is the Messiah? But we know where this man is from. When the Messiah comes, no one will know where he is from. Then Jesus, still teaching in the temple courts, cried out, Yes, you know me, and you know where I am from. I am not here on my own authority, but he who sent me is true. You do not know him, but I know him, because I am from him, and he sent me. As at this they tried to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him, because his hour had not yet come. Still, many in the crowd believed in him. They said, when the Messiah comes, will he perform more signs than this man? The Pharisees heard the crowd whispering such things about him. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees sent temple guards to arrest him. Jesus said, I am with you only for a short time, and then I am going to the one who sent me. You will look for me, but you will not find me, and where I am you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, where does this man intend to go that we cannot find him? Will he go where our people live scattered among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What did he mean when he said, you will look for me and you will not find me? And where I am you cannot come. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. On hearing his words, some of the people said, Surely this man is the prophet. Others said, He is the Messiah. Still others asked, How can the Messiah come from Galilee? Does not scripture say that the Messiah will come from David's descendants and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Thus the people were divided because of Jesus. Some wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. Last week, Prince William was talking about faith, hope and love from the Christian teaching, which he said were helpful in getting us through this present crisis. Well, I'm glad that the Duke of Cambridge realises that we need spiritual resources, but before Christianity is about faith, hope and love, it's really about God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Faith, hope and love are rather like flowers. Now, four weeks ago after my sermon, somebody sent me a text saying, thank you for that sermon. I really enjoyed looking at those beautiful flowers that were in your picture. Well, that was four weeks ago. They're not so beautiful now. That's why we have to get some new ones. Faith, hope and love, if they're cut off from their source in God, are like those cut flowers. So faith is not just about psyching yourself up. It's about putting your trust in God, staking your life on him. Hope is not whistling in the dark and hoping for the best. Hope is knowing that God has the future on the basis of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And as for love, well that's related to faith and hope in God. As Paul says, hope will not be a disappointment because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And Christianity at heart is an intense personal relationship with the living creator God who is actively involved at the heart of our lives. And when we know God, then everything lights up in a new way. I was reminded, because of the stunning nature of creation over this past spring, of an old poem which goes, 
heaven above is deeper blue, earth beneath is sweeter green. Something lives in every hue, Christless eyes have never seen. Birds in song his glories show, flowers with richer beauties shine. Since I know as now I know, I am his, and he is mine. So before Christianity is an ethical system, or social justice, or even a doctrine and creed, it is this relationship with God. So we come to John chapter 7 in our latest in our series on encounters with Jesus. And it's time for the tabernacles, the festival of Sukkot. And Jerusalem is heaving. It's a bit like, I suppose, Glastonbury. Only in Jerusalem there are a million people camped out around the hills. And this festival commemorates the time when God kept his people alive for 40 years in the wilderness. And that's why now all the people are living in shacks. And it's uh, a great time when there are many, many tourists around. Now, the locals know that the authorities are trying to kill Jesus. So, um, verse 25. At this point, some of the people of Jerusalem began to ask, isn't this the man they're trying to kill? When John talks about the Jews in his gospel, he means people from the south, Judea and Jerusalem. He's not being anti-Semitic. After all, both he, not to say Jesus, are both Jewish. But the Jews want to kill Jesus, the southerners. But those who are the tourists, the pilgrims, they know nothing about this. And they think that Jesus is a bit paranoid. So uh, they say, verse 20, you're demon possessed, the crowd answered. Who is trying to kill you? But this conspiracy was no theory. That's the background to what Jesus is about now to announce to the people. Now, every day of the first seven days of this eight day festival, the priest performed a certain ritual. He would take a golden chalice from the temple, walk down from the high point of Jerusalem down to the pool of Siloam, which is a sort of public drinking place, fill his chalice with water, march up the hill, and in the procession all the crowds would be singing things like uh, Isaiah 12, with joy you will draw water from the well of salvation. And when he got back to the temple, he would pour out the water on the altar as a tribute to how God kept his people alive for those 40 years by providing water in that dry place. The festival now has reached its climax and Jesus stands up. That's unusual because normally a rabbi to teach would sit down. It was his hearers who would stand up out of respect. And he also raises his voice. So he has something very important to tell us, a very wonderful offer to make. Last year, Confused.com spent, I don't know how many, tens or hundreds of thousands of pounds on an advert. And uh, it was about uh, a free gift. And it said there are many free gifts which are very confusing in this world. You can't really believe what you're offered. For example, a teddy bear that's fallen off the back of a lorry. But we have the ultimate free gift, which you really can trust. So what is this gift? Drum roll. Well, it's a £20 Texaco voucher when you take out a year-long motoring insurance policy through Confused.com. Well, if that's the best the world has to offer, what does Jesus have for us here? Well, he has something truly extraordinary. He says, I've got the reality of which the water in the priest's chalice is only a symbol. I have got living water. That is what uh, he says, isn't it? Verse uh, 38. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow out from within him. And the reality, as John tells us, is God's own spirit. This had been prophesied, it had been promised in the Old Testament. So here's one prophet, Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 25. 
I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. So this gift of cleansing is connected with the gift of God's spirit upon his people. Water does three things. Number one, it cleanses. If we're dirty, we need to get into water. I remember a student who came to Christ at a university mission, and she had done things in the past which left her feeling rather mucky and chop-soiled. And I asked her, what does it feel like? And she said, it's like having a shower on the inside. That's what Jesus offers by his spirit. So for the first time in your life, you feel truly and deeply clean. The gift of his spirit, like a mountain stream running through your soul, cleansing you from your past impurities. If that's what you want, then come and drink from him. Softening. That's the second thing that water does. Perhaps you have a hard heart, and you have a hard heart because you've been hurt, and your heart is hard as a defense mechanism. That's understandable, but you know it can't carry on because that hardness of heart is killing you and your family. The Spirit will soften your heart. That's why there's often tears when the Spirit is at work in your life. It's breaking you down, softening you. And in this way, the Holy Spirit can change your future, can help you to reconnect with people that you once loved, can soften you from the bitterness of the past. That's why you need the Holy Spirit of God. And thirdly, water brings refreshment. There's a lovely promise in Isaiah where God says, your life will be a well-watered garden. At the moment, the soil is very hard and the plants are beginning to wilt. We need the rain of God's Spirit to freshen us up as well because we get tired and we get dry. You see, because this is the Spirit of Jesus which is promised to us, it means that all of us have a closer connection with Jesus now than even those first disciples did when he was in the flesh. That's because Jesus says uh, uh, rivers of living water will flow from within them. The river, the spring, will be within. That means there's never any social distancing between Jesus through his spirit and us. We have that vital daily, continuous connection of the life of Jesus in us by his Spirit. That's why the Spirit is such a wonderful gift. So if that is what the gift is, how do we receive it? Well, Jesus says the gift is received by the thirsty through faith. Let's look at verse 37. Jesus said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty Come to me and drink. So according to Jesus, it is very simple. All you have to do is to be thirsty, come to him and drink. We all know what it means to be thirsty. Last week, uh, we were on our exercise uh, to Richmond. We cycled along by the river and it was a hot day. And uh, when we got there, we had some water bottles, but by then they were, the water was pretty tepid. And we were delighted to find out that uh, Joe the Juice had just reopened. And we were just uh, ready for one of these long, cool fruit drinks. So we went to the shop and we were expecting to pay. But they weren't taking cash and they weren't even taking cards. You could only order your juice online through their app. And that meant downloading their app. 
and we have small phones and old eyes and the sun was glaring on our phones and uh, you had to get the app and then you had to link a card to it and after 10 minutes we just gave up. It wasn't that easy to get a drink even though the juices were all there on a, uh, in, in the machines just before us. Jesus says, no, you just need to be thirsty. Just come to me and just drink. I wonder if you're thirsty. Perhaps uh, lockdown has taken away many of the things which normally distract you. And without all of these things, you're wondering what the purpose of life really is. Life has been put on hold. What is life for? There could be a spiritual thirst. God wants to give you his life. Or maybe it is that lockdown has thrown up quite a bit of uh, scum on the surface of your life. It's been there, but while life has been flowing, you haven't really noticed it. But now it's come to the top. And it needs to be dealt with. It needs to be cleansed. And you're thirsty. You know that your life needs to be cleaned, needs to be changed. If that's you, then come to Jesus and drink. Just drink. Jesus, cleanse me. Jesus, soften me. Jesus, refresh me by your Spirit, please. What does it mean to go to Jesus? Well, I think it means thinking about him. It means looking at his life in the Gospels. It means listening to what he says also in the Gospels and in his Word. And as you look to him, as you focus on him, as you listen to him, your uh, view of him turns to admiration and then worship and then loyalty as you lay your life before him and you realize you need him to save you, to befriend you, to accompany you through life, to be your Lord. That's what coming to Jesus in faith means. Jesus is the only leader really worth following, isn't he? I was just reflecting this week that the Dominic Cummings uh, incident could not really have happened in any other culture than one with a Christian background. Because um, in most countries, it's perfectly acceptable for leaders to say, do as I do, do as I say, not as I do. That's one of the perks of leadership. Leaders expect to be rule makers and not rule takers. But Jesus says, do as I do. And uh, he makes many, many sacrifices all the way through his life. If he did uh, go close to the rules that the Jewish people had in those days, it was only in order to feed people or heal people on the Sabbath, like we saw uh, two weeks ago. It was only to build people up. It was never to make anything himself. And indeed, he never used any of his miracle powers for his own advantage. That makes him a leader like no other, and one that I want to follow. Well, we did have uh, a couple of cans from a news agent in the end in Richmond, and um, we haven't actually stopped drinking since. That was a week ago now. We drink, of course, every day to refresh our bodies. And if you're dry spiritually now, and you haven't been to Jesus to drink for over a week, it's not really surprising you're dry. You just need to have that time with him, thinking about him, meditating on him, listening to him, and just gazing in awe at him. Go to Jesus and drink. So, if that's how the gift is received, how is it made available? Well, John tells us it's offered through the glorious death of Jesus. Verse 39. John says, By this Jesus meant the Spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. What does it mean, Jesus hadn't yet been glorified? Well, last week, Mark showed us that in the Old Testament, there are many, many trailers of the main feature, which is Jesus and the good news of God through him. 
So we saw how the manna that God provided through Moses in the desert was just a trailer of the true bread of life, who is Jesus himself, who will satisfy our souls fully and eternally. And there is another trailer from those wilderness years of how God, through Moses again, provided water for his people. And that story is in Numbers chapter 20. The people were dying of thirst and their livestock too. And they organized a, a protest and they were very angry. And Moses went to the Lord and the Lord said, Moses, take your staff and go to this rock that is behind your campsite. It's obviously a great towering rock behind where the people were. And speak to the rock and water will gush out sufficient for all of your needs. Well, Moses was very stressed. He took his staff and he raised his arm and he struck the rock. And indeed, the water poured out and all the people drank their fill and their livestock too. Now, that is a trailer of God being struck because in the ancient world, people referred to their gods as our rock. It was God who was going to be struck in order for the life-giving water to flow from him. Jesus often talked about being lifted up. And by that, he meant that he was going to be lifted up on a cross. Now, a cross, of course, is the most shameful death that anybody has ever invented. Only the worst criminals were subject to crucifixion. And the Jews also knew from the Bible that those who were hanged, they were under the curse of God as well as being under a human death sentence. So the cross was very public, very humiliating. But at the same time, it was also the most glorious thing that God has ever done. By the Son of God, Jesus, in this stunning act of self-sacrifice and courage and love, giving himself for his people, bearing all of their impurities, bearing all of their sins, bearing the judgment, the striking for what we have done that we so richly deserve. That is glorious. And that's why the Spirit comes when Jesus has died to take away our sins and the pure life of God is poured out upon his people. That's why it's like to get the gift of the Spirit, we need to stand under the cross. That's like the waterfall, the cataract, where we will become drenched in the life and love and purifying stream of God's Spirit. Well, that's the gift that is on offer, which we remind ourselves of again this Pentecost. The Holy Spirit still poured out by Jesus from heaven on all those who are thirsty. How do we get it? We just need to go to Jesus and drink. How difficult can that be? If that's what you want, go to him and ask him for this gift today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the gift of your spirit poured out upon us. We do need your spirit so that we know that you are real, you love us, you care for us, that you are holy, that you want the best for us, that you are intent on purifying us. So, Father, please pour out your Spirit on me today, perhaps for the very, very first time. I know that I need you. I need your cleansing. I need your softening. I need your refreshing. Thank you, Jesus, for your life and for your Spirit. In your name. Amen.